Please take your Bibles and open them to Mark 9, Mark chapter 9. And we will be in verses 9 through 13 today. Let me just read those to you. As they were coming down from the mountain, he gave them orders not to relate to anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man rose from the dead. They seized upon that statement, discussing with one another what rising from the dead meant. They asked him, saying, Why is it that the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And he said to them, Elijah does first come and restore all things. And yet, how is it written of the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I say to you that Elijah has indeed come, and they did to him whatever they wished, just as it is written of him. Let's pray. And Father, as we come to your word, help us to understand it more fully. Help us to live it out more clearly. And help us to love you unconditionally. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. It's one of the reasons I, I love the Gospel of Mark, and, and I hope you have come to love it as well, is he continually puts Jesus on display as the Christ, as the Messiah, the Son of God. And, and as we've been walking through this Gospel, he's always pointing us back to his main objective. To prove to his readers who Jesus was and who he said he was. And we know because we have the story at hand. We have the full gospel. And Jesus came the first time as a servant. And more specifically, he came as a suffering servant. That's what we see in Mark 10, 45. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And Mark relays that to us throughout this gospel. This servant, Jesus, is continually on the move. He's serving others by preaching and teaching and doing healings and ultimately sacrificing himself. The first half of this book, Mark demonstrated this servanthood as he described Jesus' preaching and teaching ministry and, and tacked that on with his miraculous works. But as we came to chapter 8, we saw this drastic change. We saw the ultimate rejection by the religious leaders in chapter 8, verses 11 through 13. Because of that, Jesus then focused most of his attention intently on his 12 followers, warning them of the potential dangers of, of falling into that spiritual blindness in the, in the mindset of the religious leaders. Jesus explained this even further with that object lesson of healing that blind man that we saw, causing his men really through this miracle to see him not only as a man with God-given powers, but as God himself, the Messiah that Moses and the prophets spoke of. We saw that shift as Peter proclaims the truth, observing Jesus' person as the Christ, as the Messiah. But their thinking regarding the Messiah and his purpose was, was distorted. So Jesus begins to teach them about his purpose. The Messiah came to suffer, to be rejected, to die and, and rise again. And due to that revelation, Jesus taught them about the price regarding being one of his followers, which is something similar to his own fate. You must deny yourself. You must bear your cross. You must continually and obediently follow. Just something that we all must do. But as we studied last week, we saw all of it come together. As Jesus proved all this to be true through his transfiguration. Remember, Jesus took Peter, James, and, and John up on a high mountain. And what they see? They saw Jesus transfigured before their eyes. He unveiled his humanness and displayed his divine glory. His face shone like the sun. Mark says his, his garments were radiant and were gleaming. His two companions, Moses and Elijah, appeared and talked to him regarding his purpose. 
There's confirmation by the Father. This is my beloved Son, my, my chosen one, in whom I am well pleased. And he gave him a commandment. Listen to him. Listen to what he's been teaching you regarding this coming cross. Listen to what Jesus, Moses, and Elijah were talking about on that mountain. What were they talking about? Remember, in Luke's gospel, Luke 9, 31, they said they were discussing his departure, which was about to be accomplished when he went to Jerusalem. They were talking about his rejection and his death and his resurrection. I mean, a few days prior, they rebuked Jesus for talking about his death. That's why he came. He came to save his people from their sins. And this will come about through suffering, through rejection, through his death, and through resurrection. So listen to my son, the father says, as he fulfills my perfect, sovereign, and predetermined plan. And as soon as they heard that command to listen to him, what did they see? The end of, of the transfiguration Verse 8, all at once they looked around and saw no one with them anymore except Jesus alone. So their great fear of this cloud encompassing them, this voice coming out of heaven, this great fear dissipated and turned more than likely into excitement. I mean, they couldn't wait to go tell the others what they had just experienced. I mean, sometimes as I'm reading through this, these sections, preparing, I kind of feel sorry for them. But then again, I don't. Because as they recognized Jesus as the Messiah, they had Moses and the prophets. I mean, shame on them for not connecting the dots. They've been with Jesus for at least two and a half years. They heard his teaching. They saw the great things that he did. Still, they failed to see, blinded because of their sin, what Jesus came to do. Sadly, they were more focused on the prominence that they wanted. We're going to see that later on in this chapter. Jesus, again, tells them of his, his coming suffering, and what, did, and what do they do? They're discussing on who, which one of the disciples is greatest. Their pride was getting in the way of Jesus' purpose. And we see that today as well. Nothing really has changed. Those who preach that prosperity gospel, that health, wealth, and success, they want a crown before the cross. They want the prize instead of the persecution. They, they want the riches instead of righteousness. But that's not how it is, folks. Paul continually says, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Jesus said, the world will hate you because it hated me first. There will be suffering before glory. And that should cause us to examine our own lives as well. I mean, we have the whole counsel of God. We have the Bible, 66 books, the inerrant, all authoritative word of God. We know the story and how it all plays out. We know how it ends. Yet, we still don't treat it as we should. We don't value what we have in Christ. It's because of our own sin. Because like these men, we, we want the glory sometimes before the suffering. I don't want that to be any of us this morning. So as we come to passages like this, I think sometimes it's easy to quickly pass over them because they're just a continuation of the story, and they, and they don't really mean a lot to us, right? So it's easy to look over some of the important facts within them. But this passage, although, again, it's a continuation of the story, this narrative, I believe it's packed full of Christian essential doctrines that we can draw out of it. So as we look at this text, we'll see these men pondering what had just happened in this glorious transfiguration. And Mark will give us three scenes as, as we, in order for us to set aside some of our own desires and our own wants and focus more on, on the central truths that God reveals through his word. 
Therefore, my goal today and the goal that I want for us to learn is, is to direct our attention to the doctrine that we see within this passage, which hopefully will cause us to appreciate the Lord Jesus Christ and his word more fully. And again, I'll just give you a list of the doctrines that, that I, I highlighted as I was working through this passage. The gospel is our message. That's the central truth of Christianity. Evangelism is our mission. The scriptures are our foundation. The sovereignty of God is our comfort. And the return of Christ is our hope. So again, what I want to do today, I'm going to do something a little different than what I usually do. I want to walk through this passage, explain what Mark is relaying to us regarding what's happening in this story. But by way of application, I want to circle back and highlight a little bit on these doctrines that I just li listed and, and aim our attention on these central truths so that we can rely on them more fully as we work through this, okay? So let's work through this passage and, and look at Mark's scenes, the three scenes. The first scene we see Mark display is the command to keep silent. The command to keep silent. We find that in verse 9. Look, with that, look at that with me. Mark 9, verse 9. And as they were coming down from the mountain, he gave them orders not to relay to anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man rose from the dead. So again, after this glorious event took place, they, they, they begin to come down this mountain. Luke says it was the next day, so it was probably early morning. And they begin to come down from this mountain. So they leave this place. Jesus gives them strict orders not to relate to anyone they had seen. I mean, can you imagine... The thought in their mind, the disappointment as Jesus tells them, hey, you can't speak of this to anyone. I mean, are you kidding? We can't tell the others what we have seen, what we had heard. I mean, there's been a few of you who have, who have uh, been on some trips lately, right? Tom, Bob, can you imagine telling Trish and Missy, hey, we have been to Alaska and Ireland but you cannot share those beautiful photos on Facebook. Yeah, that's not happening, right? It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. But that's what Jesus tells him. That's what Jesus tells him. And after hearing the voice come out of that cloud, listen to him. I, I guarantee their ears were heightened. We better listen. We better listen. We know they did. We know they didn't say anything. Luke 9.36 says they kept silent and reported to no one in those days anything that they had seen. But this isn't abnormal. We, we've, heard, we've seen the zip your lip comment before by Jesus, right? All throughout this gospel, back in Mark 5.43, when Jesus raised Jairus, Jairus from the dead, Peter, James, and John were with him, and he said, hey, don't tell anybody about this. Again, Mark 7.36, as he healed the deaf and mute man in the Gentile region of Decapolis, he said, keep this silent. Again, in Mark 8, 30, as Peter confessed Jesus as the Christ, he told them, don't tell anyone about me. But why did Jesus command silence? Why, why did he do this? Why didn't he want anybody to know who he was? Again, the reason we talked about this before, he didn't want to fan the flame of misguided zeal. That's what we've been seeing, this popularity. They come to him for healing, and, and, and uh, you know, they just want to be in, in this popular crowd. He knew what the people thought regarding the Messiah in those days. They understood their Messiah as, as a rescuer, as some to come and, and become king, to, to rescue them from the oppression, to overthrow the Romans. I mean, even his followers thought that. We've seen this zeal come full force. Remember when we studied the feeding of the 5,000? In John's Gospel, John 6, 14, it says, Therefore, when the people saw this sign, referring to the feeding of the 5,000, that he had performed, they said, this is truly the prophet who has come into the world. So Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force and make him king, withdrew. So with that being the case, Jesus says, don't you dare say a word about this event. And it's important to note, this is the last time we see in Mark's gospel a command like this. But it's also important to note, this is the first time we see this order given with a time limit. Jesus doesn't say you can never tell anybody about this. He just says, don't do it now. Don't tell anyone until the Son of Man 
rose from the dead. And this is, this is so vitally important right here. Because the central truth of Christianity is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Everything that stems on Christianity is the cross and the resurrection. That's the gospel. That's our message. So what Jesus is doing here is, is really connecting his glory of the transfiguration to his suffering. I must first suffer, be rejected, die, and then rise again. And until then, until that happens, don't proclaim this glorious experience. Because if you do, you're going to pour gasoline on the fire. Popularity is going to explode. You're going to divert people's attention from my purpose to suffer, be rejected, to die, to rise again. And, and by proclaiming the glory before the suffering... The gospel becomes incomplete, and there's no salvation. You cannot be saved without the death and resurrection of the perfect Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So he gives this command, don't tell anybody about this until I have died and rose again. So Jesus gives us the, them a command to keep silent. But next, we see the confusion in the disciples' minds. It's my second point, the confusion in the disciples' minds. We find that in verses 10 and 11. Mark says, They seized upon that statement, discussing with one another what rising from the dead meant. And they asked him, saying, Why is it that the scribes say that Elijah must come first? So as soon as Jesus gave this order to tell nobody about this until the Son of Man rises from the dead, Mark says, See, they seized upon this statement, and the word seized literally means to take hold tightly to the information given, without giving it up. The ESV translation says this, they kept the matter to themselves. They, they held the information tightly to themselves. They were discussing with one another what the rising from the dead meant. And I don't want you to misunderstand this verse. Their, their confusion wasn't about whether there was, was or was not going to be a resurrection. They actually saw Jesus raise people from the dead. Jairus' daughter, they saw Lazarus be raised from the dead. I mean, even the Jews in that day, even the disciples themselves, believed that in the final day, there would be a resurrection from the dead. And the religious leaders taught this. They believed this. I mean, outside of the Sadducees, that was the difference between Pharisees and scribes and the Sadducees. The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. The Pharisees and scribes, who were the main teachers of the Old Testament scriptures, they taught this. They taught of a resurrection. So Peter, James, and John would have been taught and understood from the Old Testament scriptures there would be this general resurrection on the last day. So this verse really isn't demonstrating them talking about a general resurrection. They've been taught this. They believe that this will happen. What they were discussing was in the context of the Messiah of this glory that they just witnessed. I mean, they couldn't understand what resurrection had to do with Jesus, their Messiah. So their confusion stemmed from that. Hearing Jesus' order not to speak of these events until he rose from the dead, I mean, it, that meant that he must first die. Because you can't rise from the dead unless you die first. That was their confusion in all this. So they, so they approach Jesus, and they begin to ask, or they begin to ask, uh, discuss this amongst each other first regarding the truths of the Messiah as it's related to the resurrection. I mean, they were baffled by this because the very idea that their Messiah must be tormented, rejected, put to death is just unheard of. They never heard of that. Their minds must have been burdened with the mystery. That Jesus was talking about, what, you, what is going on here? The Messiah would first die and rise again? I mean, just think of the questions that must have been going on in their mind. I mean, think of Peter. Peter, James and John asking Peter, you're the leader. You were with Jesus. I mean, you're the one that's always talking. Did he, did he tell you anything about this? What do you think he means? You go ask him. John, can you see John? Is he talking about 
the future resurrection of the final day? James, is he going to die and then rise again? If, if, that's, if he's going to have to rise again, why does he have to die? Why does he just stay alive? What does this all point to? Is he referring to a physical resurrection? Or is, it, or is he talking in figurative language? When exactly is this going to happen? I mean, it must have to happen because he's given us this command that we can't speak of this until he rises from the dead. So it must happen in our lifetime. This is what they were talking about amongst each other. Still confused. Hoping that Jesus wasn't literally talking about his death and resurrection. They were confused. But in their confusion, they stopped talking amongst each other, and then they approached Jesus. And they asked a question, not concerning the resurrection, not concerning the resurrection, but they asked about Elijah. Verse 11, they approach him and ask, saying, Why is it that the scribes say that Elijah must come first? I mean, that's a pretty good question. I'm sure it was asked again in regard to their upbringing, their teaching, that they've heard all their lives as they went and sat under the scribes, the experts and teachers of the Old Testament scriptures. They obviously taught this, or else they wouldn't have asked a, a good question like this. This probably came from the prophet Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi 3.1, which says, Behold, I'm going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. Speak of the Messiah, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come, to his temple and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. So again, according to this verse, the scribes teach that a Messiah would come, but before the Messiah would be a messenger. And what's a messenger? A messenger literally means a herald or, or a forerunner. It carries the idea of, of a king coming, and he sends his herald and says, The king is coming. The king is coming. He's preparing the way. That's what we see in Isaiah 40. Verses 3 and 4, a voice is calling, speaking of the messenger, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up. Let every mountain and hill be made low. And let the rough ground become a plain and the rugged terrain a broad valley. So the scribes would have taught before the Messiah comes, a messenger would come and prepare the way for him. But who is this messenger? Who would it be? Go back to Malachi, last chapter of the Old Testament, Malachi 4, 5, and 6. It tells us who this messenger will be. Behold, I am going to send you, here it is, Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. So again, Speaking of the great day of the Lord, before the final judgment, the establishment of the kingdom, they taught that Elijah would come first, which is true. But again, it hasn't happened yet. Okay? It hasn't happened yet. We will see this later on. But the disciples were confused regarding, again, the purpose of the Messiah. They were expecting him to come with power and great glory and, and Elijah to prepare this, and he would just establish this kingdom. I mean, they're already convinced that Jesus is the Messiah. We saw that back in Mark 8, 29. You are the Christ. You're the Messiah. So their thinking is, where in the world is Elijah? What's going on? We've been taught by the scribes that Elijah was coming. He'd perform all the duties. He'd prepare the way for the coming Messiah. Then the kingdom would come. What's going on? I mean, we just saw Elijah on the mountain. Is, is that the coming? We saw you in all your, are you going to set up your kingdom? Because that's what we're waiting. But you're, you're telling us not to tell anybody what is going on. But Jesus doesn't leave them in their confusion. He begins to explain these things in the next two verses, verses 12 and 13. The clarification of Jesus. My third point, the clarification of Jesus. And he said to them, Elijah does first come and restore all things. And how is it, and how, and yet, how is it written of the Son of Man that he will suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I say to you that Elijah has indeed come, and they did to him whatever they wished, just as it is written of him. 
So this answer, again, must have confused them even more. Elijah does first come and restore all things. Jesus is agreeing with the, with the scribes. The scribes are right. They didn't get this wrong. As much as I oppose the scribes, and you've seen that, they get it right. Elijah does first come and prepare the way for the Messiah. But even though he agreed with the scribes on this point, there's something these men and the scribes failed to overlook. Something Jesus had begun to teach these men as, as, as he, again, as they proclaimed him as the Messiah, he began to teach them something different. We saw that back in 831. The Son of Man must, be, must suffer many things, must be rejected, must die and rise again. They heard it in the conversation between Jesus, Elijah, and Moses. Folks, the Messiah first must suffer before the glory. And he's asking, guys, why have you overlooked this? They were commanded by the Father, listen to him, listen to what he's been saying. Yet you're continually overlooking this. Listen to what Jesus says. Yes, Elijah does come first and restore all things. He's speaking here of, of his future glory. But there needs to be suffering before glory can be fulfilled. They weren't connecting the dots. They were cherry picking what the scribes were describing regarding the Messiah. The Messiah will come and, and overthrow everything. He'll set up his kingdom. We'll rule with him. But they skipped over the passages regarding the suffering servant. Because listen to what Jesus says next. Here it is. How is it? How is it written of the Son of Man that he will suffer many things and be held in contempt? You're not connecting the dots. Suffering comes before glory. They were merely looking out for the glory of the kingdom, still seeking their own desires, their own prominence, looking for the Messiah who would rescue them from their oppression, set up his eternal kingdom. They failed to see throughout the scriptures that the Messiah must first suffer before glory. So in their confusion, as they ask about Elijah, alluding to what Malachi stated about Elijah and the Messiah, Jesus draws their attention to the scriptures again regarding the first coming of the Messiah, the suffering that must take place. Again, we're not told here what, if, if he even brought in scriptures. I, I, can, I, I, I can imagine that Jesus did. He was always quoting the scripture. He always explaining to them what is written. I mean, I can see him pointing back to the very beginning, Genesis 3.15, mentioning the first, the, mention, the first mention of the gospel, right? A seed will come forth and it will crush the serpent's head, but it will bruise his heel. The bruised heel means suffering. This seed will suffer. Psalm 22, Psalm 69, again, both Messianic Psalms speaking of a suffering Messiah. Most assuredly, I guarantee he probably brought up, have you not read Isaiah 52 and 53? Speaking of this suffering servant who will bear your sins, who will bear your iniquities, who will pour himself out to death. I mean, instead of focusing so much on Elijah and the glory of that, uh, that comes with that, he brings their attention back to his suffering. Something he's been relaying to them over and over and over again as they confessed him as this Messiah. Focus on this first. I must suffer, die, and rise again. This has to happen. This is the predetermined plan of the Father. This is what I came to accomplish. But with that, again, he doesn't leave them totally lost. He does clear up some of their confusion as, as he explains more in regard to their initial question. What about Elijah? Verse 13. But I say to you that Elijah has indeed come, past tense. He's already came. And they did to him whatever they wished, just as it is written of him. I mean, what do you mean Elijah has come? Where, where is he? You speaking of Elijah on the mountain? Because he didn't do what Malachi said he was going to do. He wasn't carrying on this 
this preparing your way talk. I mean, this must have puzzled them even more. I mean, outside of, the, outside of that mountain, they, they saw Elijah literally return. But who is Jesus talking about? Who is this Elijah? Jesus is speaking of the one who came in the spirit and power of Elijah. Who is he speaking of? We find that in Luke 1. He's speaking of John the Baptist. Remember, an angel came to Zechariah. You and Elizabeth, your wife, will, will bear a son. You'll name him John. What does he say? His purpose, Luke 1, 17. It is he who will go as the forerunner before him, the Messiah, in the spirit and power of Elijah. And listen to this, what the angel quotes. To turn the hearts of the fathers back to their children. Who, where did we just read that? Malachi 4, 6. John the Baptist was this coming Elijah. Again, we walk through this way back in Mark chapter 1 regarding the ministry of John the Baptist, right? They had stark similarities between Elijah, the real Elijah that we find in First and Second Kings, and in John the Baptist, the physical appearances, his clothing, the food that they ate, locusts and wild honey, the fiery preaching that they both uh, proclaimed, the call to repentance. Again, we're not told in Mark, but Matthew, in his account says that these men, as Jesus said this, they came to realize that Jesus was speaking of John the Baptist. So it clicked. They all failed to realize the significance of John's ministry. He was the messenger preparing the way for the Messiah's first coming. I mean, that's what John said, right? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He was his messenger. He prepared the way for Jesus. Yet, they didn't accept him. They didn't treat him, or they really treated him as, as they did the Elijah of the Old Testament. I mean, if you go back to 1 Kings 19, again, you can read that on your own, but we, we see more similarities between Elijah and John the Baptist. Elijah dealt with an evil king and queen, Ahab and Jezebel. They would have killed Elijah if, if God didn't take him early in 2 Kings 2. But John the Baptist was similar. He, he had a battle with a king and a queen. We talked about that, Mark 6, Herod and Herodias. But they did to John what they would have done to Elijah. They arrested him, they imprisoned him, and they killed him. Therefore, John, again, wasn't literally Elijah, but he came in the spirit and power of Elijah. He was a type of Elijah. He prepared the way for the coming Messiah. Sadly, if the nation of Israel would have studied the scriptures and accepted John and, and accepted his message of repentance, they would have realized that he, this, here's the prophecy who was to come. And they would have realized who Jesus was as well. But they didn't. He didn't. There was a purpose for that, right? Because the Son of Man came to first suffer told about it. Moses and the prophets told about that. And why was that necessary? To save his people from their sins. To save his people from their sins. I mean, that's where we find hope in the gospel. Through the substitutionary atoning work of Jesus Christ. And through that, again, we're in the church age. We're, we're in that dispensation of the church age, awaiting the coming of the Lord Jesus as we study the scriptures, we can see that, that there's another Elijah coming when the Messiah returns. That, that I, whether or not it's going to be a literal Elijah, I don't know. But we, knew, we do know he will come in the spirit and power of Elijah. He will prepare the way for the return of the Lord. He'll proclaim the gospel as Jesus comes in power and great glory and will set up his kingdom. Again, there's so much to learn from this passage why it's important to study the word of God and again even though these men didn't fully understand everything at this time when they were living it out we don't understand everything either but we must continue to study we continue to learn we're lifelong learners we can continue to grow through these passages and as we do that again we pull out essential truths in these passages even kind of meaningless passages like this. I mean, that, that, how many times have you read through this and was just read through it really fast? Don't get anything out of it. 
And again, as I finish, again, I want to just circle back. I want to highlight some of those truths that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk. And as we leave today, I, I really want you to dwell on these truths. In order for us to appreciate the Lord Jesus, in order to appreciate his work more fully in his word. First, again, the gospel is our message. This is all application. I, I just was thinking through this, studying this passage. This was a tough passage for me this week. But the gospel is our message. We see here Jesus came to suffer, to die, to rise again. That's central to Christianity. He accomplished everything we couldn't do. He's the sinless lamb of God and, and satisfied the wrath of God deserved for sinners as he died on the cross as our substitute. And, and the resurrection really is the receipt of God really demonstrating that the penalty for sin has been fully paid. And outside of that message, there's no hope. That's what Jesus says. Unless you believe in this, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. I've came to save sinners from their sin, from their self, from God. And I did it as I accomplished my work on the cross. And God highly exalted him, rose him from the dead, satisfied with his payment. But once... We see that accomplished, and once we, we take that to heart and know that is our message, next we see evangelism is our mission. Another doctrinal truth in Christianity is God uses us as his representatives. We're his messengers. We're his herald. Evangelism is our, mis our mission. Jesus told these men, don't say anything until the gospel is fulfilled. They obeyed. And we know what these men did after the resurrection, don't we? They turned the world upside down. They preached the gospel to every creature. They went and made disciples, baptizing them, teaching them all that Jesus commanded them to teach them. They were witnesses first in Jerusalem, then in Judea and Samaria, then to the ends of the earth. We are here because of them. And we must do the same. That's our mission. We proclaim the gospel. Next, the scripture is our foundation. Again, Jesus was always pointing them back to the scriptures. They knew scripture, but they didn't take the whole counsel of God. The scribes were right about Elijah. There's a coming of Elijah. There will be another coming of Elijah. But you forgot the part about the suffering servant. Most important part, you forgot. He must suffer. You need to start connecting the dots, and we need to start connecting the dots. One of our prime interpretive methods here is the analogy of faith. Scripture interprets Scripture. We need to teach and preach the whole counsel of God. There are pastors there today, and you know many of them, who say, forget that Old Testament. The Old Testament is so important. Stop listening to people like that. They're false teachers. All Scripture breathed out by God, is profitable. From Genesis to Revelation, it's all profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and training in righteousness. It's our living and active book. We rely on what the scriptures bring about of our understanding of who God is and all that he has in store for us. So the scriptures are our foundations. Next, we see that the sovereignty of God is our comfort. God is in control. God gave us his plan. We, we know what happens. We even know he wins. Why are we so worried? Believe me, I, I worry my fair share, believe me. But we need to rely on God as our sovereign God because that's our comfort. He knows all things. He works together all things for our good, to those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. Right? I love what Charles Spurgeon said. He said, The doctrine of the sovereignty of God is the pillow I rest my head on at night. We can sleep soundly because God is in control. Even though we go through trials, we go through persecution, I mean, that's expected. Those who name the name of Christ will suffer persecution. No, God's in control. No, God's in control. And that leaves us with the last essential truth that, that I 
was thinking this week, the return of Christ is our hope. Christ first came to suffer, die, rise again, but again, he will come again. He's promised that. And he will come in power and great glory. Just like they saw on that mountain. We'll see him just as he is. We know there will be a forerunner. We know he'll prepare the way for this coming as well. We know he'll come in the spirit and power of Elijah. Again, Revelation, Tom, you probably have a, a, a list of things regarding Elijah and, and the two witnesses in Revelation 11. If you want to know, get that. But we should long for that day. 1 John 3, 2. Because when Jesus appears, we will be like him. Because we will see him just as he is. That's our hope. But until then, we find comfort in studying the scriptures, studying these passages, knowing that we have the gospel, knowing we're ambassadors for Christ, knowing we have the truth of God's word, knowing that he's in control. So again, these sections for me are, are profitable. They're helpful, again, as you read through them, saying, what, what truths do I see out of this? What can I pull out to help me grow, to set aside my sin, to cast off my own desires and, and set our mind on things above, on God's desires? Remember, if that's what Jesus was saying when Peter rebuked him. You're setting your, your mind on man's interest, not God's. It's passages like these where Jesus says, hey, I came to first suffer, die, rise again. Elijah will come, I'm coming again. Don't worry, don't worry, I'm in control. When I, when I rise from the dead, go out and proclaim it on the mountaintops. Is that what you desire? We should. We should. That's what he desires of us. He wants us to be conformed to the image of his son, right? That's his purpose for us. Let's do that together. Okay? Let's pray. Oh, Father, we are so grateful for your words. Even passages like these that, that we, I mean, we know the story and we're looking at these guys and, and saying, uh, how did you not see this? Well, again, we don't see everything clearly. As we were talking about this morning, we see things dimly as in a mirror, but, but one day we'll see fully. We look forward to that day. But until then, keep us faithful. Keep us faithful to you, to your word, and help us to proclaim you even more. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.